Evening, everybody, and welcome from York for our 12th Is It Open Clock Club. Um, we've got the snow here, only a weeny little bit, for, but for us Brits, that's kind of enough. Everything goes into meltdown, uh, pardon the pun, so all the public transport stops and nobody can go anywhere. So that's where we're at. It's been freezing all week, uh, so we're nice and cosy. Hope you're all okay out there. You may have seen we've had a busy old week here at How to Repair Pendulum Clocks, and I'll bring you up to speed uh, a bit on that. And then we're going to talk about files and filing, and um, like the most exciting subject ever, but it does seem to get people quite animated, so uh, we'll crack on with that in a minute. So a normal housekeeping uh, note, this uh, session is being recorded. I hope I better just check. Uh, can't see it, but yes, it's been recorded. So um, if you want to remain anonymous, then turn your video off and uh, the session will be on our Open Clock Club archive later on this evening for people to watch. And it surprises me that um, I'm delighted, of course, and delighted that you're all here to join us this evening. But also it slightly surprises me that um, it seems to be a really uh, popular thing to watch after as well. So that's great. Our numbers are building week on week. So massive thank you to uh, you lot for your support. And those of you that have seen our new videos, I've got one about making a completely convoluted sort of tool to make the spanners and another one about files and filing. Now the file one has already raised such a lot of interest and questions. We thought we'd talk about that today. We are bearing in mind that we've still got unfinished business on um, uh, the pallets and pallet refacing and so on. But somewhere here, I've gotten, uh, sorry, as we get busier every week, the whole screen, I think it's named two of those screens. I've got some, ground flat stock one millimeter uh, gauge plate with which we're going to make some new strip pallets so we'll talk about hardening and tempering and bending and making a jig and all that kind of stuff uh, we used to, john and i uh book club john used to make these strip pallets as um part of a short course that we ran where we made a little kind of working clock in a week which is basically an escapement in a frame and it was a complete panic we did it in five days and it shortened our lives massively but it, the bit that really really flawed people was bending the pallets around and shortening them to get their escapement to to work and i'll tell a bit of a story and apologies to this person but uh there been there's always one in the group if any of you have ever taught you'll know that there's always one person who kind of has a lot off and uh this person had been kind of right really you know sort of having a lot of all week it was really good fun we had we had it shortened our lives but we had a good laugh and it came right to the last sort of morning where everybody had to get their clocks ticking and this person uh we were making uh the square escapement we talked about last week and this person cut too much off the pallets and they they messed up they said oh, i've messed up the whole thing's never going to work and the pallets were embracing seven and a half teeth so I just kind of like, I've only ever done one cool thing in my life and this was it. And I just got my pliers and bent them around till they embraced six and a half teeth and it worked fine and everything was happy. So we're going to uh, make some strip pallets maybe next week uh, because we haven't still yet got down to that question about refacing pallets. We've done quite a bit on uh, geometry. So what else has happened? We've got our videos out, a um, bit more showing off. Ooh, everything's chaotic. Uh, we got um, my article published in the uh, Institute of the History of Natural Sciences, Chinese Academy of Sciences, and oh, my things dropped out, but it's um, about clock uh, conservators and their, there it is, um, and their approach to clocks. So this was an, art, uh, a, um, an event that I was involved with the Science Museum where we went to Beijing in the days when you could go places and fly and looked at automata in the uh, Imperial Palace there. So that was cool. So really pleased that that's come out. If anybody wants to read it, uh, if they need a bit of light bedtime reading, then send me an email and I'll send you um, a link to it. 
So files and filing, where do you begin? And there's um, an elephant in the room here, of course. I'm not gonna say what it is, otherwise it wouldn't be the elephant in the room, would it? Uh, but we all know what the elephant in the room is and uh, we'll try and avoid that or not. Okay, files and filing. I'll go through what I said in the, uh, the video in case there are any questions. As always, um, these sessions are about me uh, yakking on a lot. Uh, my collar's up, nobody ever told me. Um, but the, the real kind of value of these is the community uh, and that's you people talking to each another and through Open Clock Club team here. So please keep the live chat going. Anybody who's got snow, we wanna know who's got the most snow. Um, so uh, Sam, have you got snow? <laughs> no, Sam's got no snow. So we're winning here in York with about that much. Who's got the most snow? Um, oh, people are still entering as well. So uh, let's catch up. So in our book, volume one, how to repair pendulum clocks and volume two and the bushing and depthing is coming along. Bad news or slightly bad news for people are waiting for the hard copy in America. We got a message yesterday from um, UPS that say because of Brexit and yeah, um, that they have got no warehouse capacity. So they've actually sent one of our three boxes of books back, which is kind of not what we wanted to see. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that some of them get through, um, but they were meant to be in America uh, yesterday and they're not. And so they're blaming Brexit or the COVID or something like that. So going back to our book, when we talk about files and filing, we're really talking about new making. There are some exceptions to that, um, but I don't know how many of you have gotten into new making or even made a new clock just to kind of make a, a point here, if you've got that burning sort of desire, as many of, as many of you will do, to make change and do creative things and make stuff, my strong advice to you, and it sounds like an easy thing to say, is to make a new clock because it kind of gets all that stuff out of the system. Uh, again, not looking back too much, but in the old days when I was teaching, uh, we the students used to jump in straight away with what then they called restoration work. So you'd be on a, um, an undergraduate program and then you'd get an 18th century tall case clock on your bench. And of course, it didn't work for the clocks, it didn't work for the students, it didn't work for the clients, it didn't work for anybody. So we're introduced a uh, craft practice year, like a um, foundation degree, where everybody on that program makes a clock in its entirety. And it was really the best thing because you get to use the tools, you do wheel cutting, you think about the geometry and the math and all that kind of stuff. So if you kind of chomping at the bit to do stuff, then uh, make a clock. And there are some good books. The, uh, I don't know about the States, but in England, there's a really, uh, was a really great engineer called Alan Timmins, who was involved in the Formula One world. And he made a book called making an eight day long case clock, I think, which my uncle had made part of that clock. Really good, he, he does nice drawings. Uh, Alan's no longer with us, he was an interesting guy. He was using carbon fiber to make guitars like when I first started in horology, so really ahead of his time. And there's John Wilding as well. If you have, uh, I guess some of you will have John Wilding's um, books or publications, they're really good. He talks, in fact, he does series on making new stuff as well. So look at that. And maybe one day we'll be encouraged to write a new book. And it's also Daniel's. So files are really for new making, but you do need them in the repair or restoration workshop. The only place we talk about them, I'll just try and move this out of the way, I can't say, in our book is here. Um, and that is filing the uh, suspension spring. Here we are of one of our Smith clocks. This one's a bit beaten up. And the reason we uh, do that, and there's an important point to this, if I hadn't lost uh, half the parts, is because the suspension spring is too tight in the back cock normally of the clock. Where's it gone? I had it a minute ago. Anyway, uh, I'll find it in a bit. And what we show you is just to make this uh, you can see it's punched, the top block pinhole is punched through. So on this side, there's kind of a little crater. And on this side, 
uh, it has been flattened out a bit, but it's usually um, too tight. So we advise people to take a file. And this is a really important point. Um, I think, again, with the beginners, when you want to file something flat, the kind of natural instinct and understandably is to clamp it in the vise so it's sort of nice and firm and try and file it flat. And you kind of never can get it perfectly flat that way. What you have to do is rough it out and then, um, I don't know what's happened with the light here, rough it out and then actually hold the bit of work in your hand or on your finger. And I'll turn this over. What this does is it means that the two surfaces have to work together like this. So uh, in that video that I just made, I show a thing or like a principle of a swing tool. And this is how all the chronometer makers used to make all that beautiful flat finished, black finished work is that they made a lot of these things called swing tools. So the two things work together. So when you file this, you can easily manipulate it and the two things stick together. So if you, I guess if you've been doing this a while, but for the beginners there, just get a piece of brass um, sheet, scrap or something. Uh, here, I had an old uh, back cock casting. And so, yes, you might rough it out by holding it in the vise, but if you actually want to get it flat, then um, just hold it in your hand. That's the way to get it as flat as possible which leads me on to a second, and you can do the bevels and things like this. This is, I just found this kicking about. Leads me on to my second point, which is uh, this question of which are the go-to files, Matthew? And so I think in the um, Facebook thing, we said, bring along your favorite file. So is the live chat happening, Rach? Yeah. Right, anybody told us what the favorite file is yet? All right, okay. So. <laughs> let us know what your favorite file is and I think uh we're speaking to John about this one of his favorites is this file the barrette which is kind of slightly unusual one you might not have um come across before but we'll come back to that in a bit in a bit because that's probably not where people start people typically start with something like uh something like this so this is a hand file. Now a hand, obviously they're all hand files. Hand is the name of the pattern uh, as opposed to the, let's just actually, wait, let me mess about here. There we are, brighten it up a bit. Hand is the name of the pattern. So this file has got three cut sides. It's rectangular in section, can't really see there. Um, it's got three cut sides, so it's got two flat sides of cut. It's got this edge, which is cut just with straight cuts like that. Uh, and it's got a safe edge. And I won't bother repeating everything I talked about in the, in the video because it's there and you can look at it any time. But please keep the live chat coming and I'll expand on uh, any of those uh, sort of things that we covered. So this is maybe the go-to file. It's a six inch file. The six inches relates to the length of the blade, not the length of the overall thing when you're ordering some. But um, we got some feedback on that video straight away and uh, somebody said, yeah, but these files are quite expensive, which they are. And um, I mean, I think the hand files are about 15 pounds. However, they do last a long time unless you kind of work them on the jaws of your vice or something. So, um, what I've done is I've ordered three hand files from Valorb. This is the Swiss kind of most common make. There's all sorts of make. There's um, Stubbs used to be in England, but like everything else here, they've gone out of business. Uh, there's Nicholson, there's Barco, which is probably a rebranding exercise. There's Beta, all sorts of uh, breeds. And we'll see some of those as we go through the Motley selection that I've got. So. Valorb make three grades of file. Uh, I can't remember what they call the medium two, but I've ordered some of the precision file like this, and I've ordered some of the medium grade, which are only five pounds each. So for you know the price of one of these, you can buy three of the others. And I'm gonna do a kind of non-scientific experiment. I don't quite know what that is gonna look like, but if you've got any ideas, 
And I suppose, what do you want from a file? Um, for me, we were talking about this earlier, I just kind of like the idea that they're there in the drawer, you know, they're kind of like money in the bank. I don't know why. I think it's because when I grew up, maybe like other people here, um, some of you will be from engineering kind of families. My uh, family, although they were retailers and we did some jewellery repairs, um, the kind of tools that were lying about were pretty ropey. So there was a file, it was rusty, it had no handle, wouldn't cut butter. Um, so when I could kind of got into the world of horology, I wanted to know all this stuff and buying a new file, like a Swiss file was like a, you know, a, like Christmas, really, uh, really cool stuff. So, oh, Derek's got his hand up. Can you, can you see him? Derek's put his hand up, so we'll... Oh, Derek. Hello. Hi, Derek. Uh, I have I have Vilobi files or however you pronounce it, yeah. but I struggle to clean them. We're going to get onto it. We're going to get onto it. We um, probably in the second session this evening. I've uh, hopefully got that covered. So thank you for prompting me on that and reminding. Okay. Me. Yeah, we'll okay, get. Okay. Thank you. So um, anyway, I, I find a file was like this amazing gem that turned up. So I totally understand people's uh, reticence to get them. So we've bought some, they'll be here next week and we'll do some kind of experiments. Just before I move on um, to the safe edge issue, remind you that um, some of the files, or well, some of my files don't have handles on, um, but please, I made a video about it, uh, put handles on. And if you haven't seen the video, I found this brand, Python, uh, really, uh, good. They've got solid beechwood handles and they've got this really strong, I've drilled this by the way, it doesn't come like that, rolled on ferrule. Uh, so I show the way to fit them, that I, you know, I think is the best way because they don't fall off basically. But don't be tempted to, um, let's just find a file, don't be tempted to use a file like this uh, without a handle because there's always that chance that it'll slip and it'll go in there and there'll be blood everywhere. And also, um, you know, I'm not a, an engineer and so it'd be interesting to hear what people say, but you hear a lot of people say, don't use a file on a lathe. And of course, everybody does. It's just like the most incredibly useful thing. But what I would say is if you do use a file on the lathe, then absolutely it's got to have a handle on it. Otherwise you're asking for trouble. So let's just talk about this safe edge uh, issue here. So the safe edge is basically an edge that hasn't got any teeth on it. Pillar files typically have got two safe edges, um, files everywhere, uh, they've got two safe edges. Uh, but when you get the file, as I say in the video, there's either on these good quality files, a little bevel on there, or even worse, when the file's been made, um, the teeth have kind of been curled over the edge. So if you're filing something like this backcock, and you want to file into the corner there, what you find is that there's a mark on here, it actually wears it away. And this is where the barrette file is incredibly useful. So when you've got your a new file like this, the first thing I would suggest, and it's been done on this one, I'll see if I can, um, yeah, here's one look that hasn't been stoned. And you can see, they're not teeth on there, but it's kind of quite rough on the edge and it's certainly not a square edge. So what I do is, I won't waste too much time on this, but take an abrasive stone. You might have a diamond plate, saying a steel plate with diamond impregnated in it. You might have um, uh, a, a carborundum stone, like a fine oil stone or something. I went off using the oil stones because they are oily and everything gets a bit clarty, um, as my granny would say. So I just now use uh, this ceramic stone. I can see this one's broken. There's something about these stones. I don't know what it is, but after a while, they kind of self explode. I've glued it together loads of times. Um, so the first thing to do when you get your file is to put it down like that and actually stone off that edge, keeping it nice and square. Now, uh, I've got 
uh, an apology to make because in my file I bitched on about sandpaper or abrasive paper. Don't use abrasive paper for this. I've got a bit of an obsession about not liking it because I see so many people using it on historic work and it just kind of rounds everything. And I'll, I'll get off my soapbox in a minute, but of course, one of the, as I say in the video, one of the underpinning kind of tenets of horological manufacture is sharp angular detail. And if you use abrasive paper, even if it's glued down on a sheet of glass, uh, you still get rounding. And so um, I'm not a massive fan of it. I've got it. And very occasionally it's like the thing that you need, but these um, ceramic stones are really good. So when you buy your new file, you can see there, look, I've already taken off. In fact, you can see the shape it was uh, by the little witness mark there. So put um, a safe edge on it. Let's just move that, clean up. Um, yeah, one thing I didn't mention, of course, uh, did in the video, is the, these are double cut files, which is a different thing from a number two cut file. So this is uh, a Bedford file from Sheffield in the old days when, um, I love, by the way, maybe you can't see it there, but these file makers usually put a little animal on as their kind of trademark. This is a, something, I'll look at it in my eyeglass in a minute, cockerel, I think. So you can see there's one set of teeth cut like this, and then there's another set of teeth that are cut like that. And in fact, we'll go jump into cleaning so I don't forget to um, answer Derek's uh, question immediately after the break. I've got no idea how we're doing for time. All oh, right, okay, we're nearly ready for a little comfort break anyway. So this is a double cup file. And you might say, well, Matthew, if that's a double cup file, what else is there? Well, there. Uh, this is um, a file <laughs> John gave me. So this is probably my biggest file and this is about my smallest file. Bless, but it's quite good fun. Uh, John got me this, this file. Um, you see it's a bit of a, an animal, but the point is it's single cut. So it's kind of more like a rasp really, I suppose. And I know for things like filing aluminium and filing lead, there are special files so they don't clog. The problem with single cut files on brass is that you build up a resonance pattern. So you file across and you can imagine if you've ever seen those roads, like a dirt road where the car suspension makes resonance patterns, it's kind of the same thing that file tooth goes in the gap that the last one's made. And it's kind of difficult to get rid of those. So um, when you buy in files, check that they are in fact uh, double cut. So you can see this is, Great, thank you again, Derek, for um, reminding me about the cleaning. Uh, I'll tell you about what's happened on the end because you can see it's had a bit of abuse there, but really, really useful uh, abuse. Let's take, um, let's come back at 25 minutes past and we will jump into file cleaning. See you in a minute.
Welcome back, everybody. We've got some great questions coming before we just jump into this cleaning thing. Um, can you talk about wheel cutting by hand sometime? That's a really pertinent question because I haven't told um, the team Open Clock Club here yet, but um, I just kind of got this project going in the back of my, not that I have enough projects on, is to make a clock by hand and cut and file all the teeth. Uh, this is something that came out of the NAWCC forum uh, to do with, uh, anyway, um, yeah, let's not go there. Anyway, yeah, great idea. I'd love to make a clock by hand, a little kind of virgin folio um, wall clock, which uh, takes us on to the question by, um, from Wolfie, no snow where Wolfie is, oh, sorry about that. Um, virgin folio ac accuracy is non-existent. Good question. How accurate is a virgin folio? Lots of... Um, people uh, talking about this in the kind of academic uh, world. Um, does John Wilding have sets of books? I don't know, John, do you know the answer to that? You, you've had quite a few John Wilding books, haven't you? You'll have to unmute. I think um, you've, um, you've probably sold them on eBay now, but I did actually have a more or less complete set, which we used to use in I left at your house, but I mean, almost any kind of of clock you can think of, he's written a book on how to make it. Yeah, really, really cool um, tools as well. So yeah, uh, we don't know about John Wilding, but you, the books are kind of like um, bound magazine journal articles, and they're as far as I know, and they're really good. One of the few reliable clock books. Um, uh, Rob says, hand file faces are curved, not flat. They absolutely are. This is really important. Uh, let's just have a look at a file. I can find when I've got hundreds. So when we, uh, I think what uh, Rob means is when you look along the length of the file, if I can, uh, uh, not only are they tapered, but they're also slightly convex as well. And this is really important when we're filing flat. Because if you imagine you've got this uh, thing here that you're filing like this, if you press down on it, um, the file's actually going to become concave like that. So you're never going to achieve a flat surface. Um, whereas if this is already uh, convex, and when you hold the file like this, you're actually holding it in tension. This is where it's going to snap, no doubt, uh, like that. So this is the filing surface. So it's not kind of bending down at the edges. I think, again, when you begin, you get the file like this, you press down on it, and you can never get the work flat. So that is presumably by design that it's both tapered and ever so slightly convex, which enables you to file flat. Uh, I don't know whether that's Rob Thompson or not. Is it Rob Thompson? Yeah, it's Rob Thompson. Uh, Rob is a um, master of the art of filing flat so he can tell you maybe he'll do a guest session one minute and he's made a clock on our uh, year-long program um crossover between files and stones like tam o'shanter yeah the tam o'shanter is a thing particularly for stoning brass down uh, but there are of course those other ones like the degusit stone which is an aluminium oxide stone and the uh, arkansas stones Maybe we'll have a session on those uh, to do with finishing steel. Maybe we can tie that in with hardening and uh, tempering steel or something. And um, question, question, question. Where are the ceramic stones from? Um, the ceramic stone ones I use are global brands, so G L O B A L. They make kind of uh, the Japanese um, uh, kitchen knives. Now, I think they're actually available quite a lot cheaper than that. And as you can see, for some reason, those global stones kind of self-destruct after a couple of years. But yeah, that's a global 1,000 grit. I've also got a four or 6,000 grit cat remember, which is useful for polishing. And then a, a, a coarser one, which is too soft and it's not much useful for anything. So, okay, so clean now fire. We can see here, we've got some rust in there. We've got some wood in there. We've got a bit of steel stuck in it. Um, and on this side, it looks like it's been well and truly abused. There was this question which I kind of answered in the video about, do you have separate um, files for brass and separate files for steel? When I first started and I was a student at the Orological Institute, 
their workshop was beautifully laid out, of course. And so they had uh, files for steel and files for brass. And as I alluded to, if you use them for the wrong thing, you get into trouble, which is perfectly fine for me. As you can tell, a little bit more chaotic. I kind of get into the zone. So I just pick up a file and use it and whether it's for steel or brass. But what you will find is that when the file gets um, for Rob, I've got the, let's just find it. Where's it gone? For Rob, I've got the mighty magic file here, which is um, one that I got from my grandfather. Uh, and it's like completely worn out, but it's also nearly the most useful um, file there is. So when they get worn, don't chuck them away because they have uses. So this is kind of halfway between a burnisher, whatever that does uh, to discuss, and, um, and a, a very fine file. This is maybe an eight cut file or something. And this again is used in new making where you wanna get a finish, let's say a bevel on a collet or something, and you don't want it to be polished because old clocks weren't the kind of, you know, uh, 18th, 19th century clocks weren't polished when they were made, but you want it to be kind of smart looking. So the magic file, which is basically just a worn out old file is really, um, really useful. So uh, we're gonna try and get rid of this stuff. Now, when you go online and you um, ask for a file cleaner, I haven't got one, unfortunately, but what you'll get is basically a steel brush. Um, apologies if I offend people here, don't use that steel brush. Hardened steel bristles, if you just paid 15 quid for a file, you don't wanna put hardened steel with it because it'll effectively kind of blunt it or prematurely wear it out. So you probably need a brass brush, but actually what we use for cleaning a file is um, a bit of brass basically. So what I've got here, and this is kind of the pattern that we developed at uh, the college that students made as an exercise. It's two millimeter brass. You can see it's being used for all sorts. It's got a hole in the end of it so you can hang it up and then it's tapered here and it's like uh, an inch to three quarters of an inch wide, something like that. Really useful thing to make. And what you do uh, to clean your file, there's what, another one here, which is the same thing, but I put some uh, scales on it, some tufnol scales that I've uh, riveted on. Let's just, now I am actually gonna put the um, file in the vise, which might, might make some people cringe a little bit, but it'll just make it easier to hold. It's just like that. I'll get some light on there. Now you'll remember that our, um, file has got this um, double cut arrangement. So we're going to, now, yes, this is going to damage the uh, teeth on the side of the file. There's no way around that. I should use vice protectors. I'm not actually particularly fussed about those straight teeth. I think they're completely useless. Um, however, I take the point. Uh, if you've got good new files, don't put them in the hardened steel jaws of a vise. So um, what we're going to do is take our piece of brass, which is just a regular bit of brass, nothing special about it, and begin working it. Um, get it out of the way of my hand. Be show, your hand. show my hand. Yeah, show the grip. Oh, the grip. Oh, yeah. So like this. And begin working it along this primary cut of the file, not the secondary cut, the primary cut. And of course, what happens is the um, file cuts into the brass. So the brass follows the profile of the teeth. And after you've cut three or four um, times like this, you can see, I don't know if you can see on there, but the file cleaner is ejecting all the drops from the file. And once you get into it, uh, we've got a bit here that's um, a little bit of steel. So just tip it up, sorry about all the wobbling, tip it up on its side. You can see that, oh, you, can, you can actually see it there. And it just ejects. We've got all sorts of upgrades coming um, through the spring and summer, by the way, and our camera 
and tripod and all that stuff. So we're moving on up. And um, another exciting development is the fact that we think we're going to do some live streaming on um, working on three rusty old clocks that we bought, but um, announcement to follow. So look how easily um, this file cleaner ejects that rubbish there from this file. I'll just go along like this. And you see, it doesn't take long. And the reason it's really important is because if you're filing on brass, you're making something new and uh, you um, don't clean your file, it'll ruin the work because a bit of material gets stuck in the file and you just keep filing and filing and filing more and more and more and you actually never get... Um, So obviously spending a little bit more time than I'm doing here, but that is how you clean the file. You can dig at particularly nasty bits there, but basically that's it. Don't use one of those file cards. Um, then finish with a, I said looking for it, here we are, um, a brass bristle brush. If you want just to clear out the last bits of um, material, I see. Oh, ah, yeah, it's gone now. So just finish with a brass brush like that. And you are good to go, I think. Just got a little bit of a lighting situation going on. And there we are. So you saw that file was all rusty and, uh, and horrible, so that's cleaned it out. So that's how you um, clean files, basically, with a bit of brass. Now, it's a bit more difficult with something like a half round file, of course, on the back, because you can't really follow the teeth. So again, if you give it a good old brushing with the brass, uh, brass brush, that'll work really well. You can get those brass brushes from a jewelry supplier or from a shoe repair shop, because it's a kind of similar thing that you use for brushing uh, suede shoes. So that's where you'll um, pick one of those up. So more questions, Richard, one grip. Uh, AP or loose? Tightly, grip tightly is my answer, but I don't, I don't know. Uh, where do you get your brass brush from? Yeah, from in England, from Cookson's, who are the uh, jewellery suppliers. I find they've got the best website in England. There's HS Walsh, there's Cousins, um, I don't find those websites particularly kind of user friendly, but Cookson's Gold, I don't know whether they've got a US branch or not, are brilliant for tools and things because they just send it straight away and they've got uh, lots of stock uh, questions. Matthew? Yeah? Um, I mean, if people want a small amount of brass, eBay is a really good place. All right, okay, yeah. Yeah, it is. If you don't want to buy um, a whole uh, sheet of the stuff, just uh, a little bit, yeah. Um, how do you keep your files from getting clogged up, especially fine needle files? Yeah, it's a good question. And the old books, and I do this, uh, I'm going to look for it maybe in our second break, which will be in a couple of minutes anyway. So they put chalk in the file teeth, and I find on the course of files, that does work. Uh, I'll just leave you to it for a second. I'll see if I can find my block of chalk. Well, it's a problem with putting, um, you can see this file here, oops, uh, it's got chalk in it. So you just put chalk in it like that. Um, and of course the problem with this is that chalk gets everywhere and everything gets covered in white and you've got to clear it out, but it does, uh, help with stickier materials. So you'll find that filing um, stuff like this, which is uh, free cutting brass, it's got quite a lot of lead in it, is not a problem because it turns into little granules or swarf. Uh, same thing with hardened and tempered steels, but things like mild steel is a bit of a pig. Aluminium, of course, is, is all sticky and gooey. That Try doing that. I've never found it massively successful. Um, but that's what the uh, old books say. Um, do you always file dry or do you use lubricants? No, I always file dry. I mean, maybe this chalk actually, French chalk actually does act as a bit of a lubricant, but it's a bit like using the piercing saw. Somebody asked me about that um, 
do you use a lubricant? I find it just blunts the blades. It seems to allow it to kind of cut too quickly. And there's a question also about, can you refinish files? Now, this is something, I'd, again, I'd, if anybody has any experience of kind of renewing files, I'd love to hear how you got on. Um, you, I've heard about putting them in vinegar or ferric chloride, is it, um, to or alum to actually eat away at the file. And I kind of get that that could work. I can see that it could be successful. I've never done it. If you've ever done it, then I'd love to hear um, what you did and how um, how successful uh, it was. So, uh, machine cut file. Yeah, I suppose if you've got a handmade file uh, where there's a slight discrepancy between the pitch of the teeth, the beauty of that is you don't get that resonance because the, the teeth can never fall in the other gap. Single cut or use the brush for into it. That pattern. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, let's talk about um, the course, as I said, coarsenesses. Uh, how fine the teeth are on this file. So how many, the kind of teeth per inch or teeth per centimeter as the Swiss call it. So they have a numerical system. This I think is, well, it's an English file. I think that's about a number two cut. Uh, this is a number four cut, if you can see there. And again, I'll have to leave you for a half a second or more. This is a new old stock file I got, but I show you this because it's actually got the number on it, as you can see it there, but it's a double zero cut. So this is actually quite coarse. So double zero is the kind of coarsest off the shelf file that you tend to be able to buy. I think there are four zero as well, which are even coarser, through to number six cut, which I've got here somewhere. Um, let's see. Yeah, so there's um, a number six cut file. So let's put them in order. Oops, again, slight chaos. There we are, something like that. So we've got a double zero. I haven't got um, a zero here, a zero cut, I think. This is a two, that's a four, that's a six. You maybe can't quite see um, on the camera there the difference in the finenesses. The problem with this scale, and people get a bit obsessed by it, is it's just a thing that the manufacturer makes up. So you get differences between different manufacturers. And also it's not, um, I don't know what you'd call it, but it's not an absolute scale. It's not the same scale for all files. So as an escapement file, for instance, that's a number two, will have different teeth per centimeter or TPI, T per inch, than uh, a bigger file. So only use that as a broad, um, broad kind of uh, a guide, zero and double zero are actually incredibly useful because if you uh, believe that time is money, uh, I don't know, but um, you can really crack on in new making in removing a whole lot of uh, brass and things. So who are good, who are good ma file manufacturers? I don't know if there's anybody left in America or Canada that make uh, new files. Can we, um, you guys will know better than me. But um, in England, I don't think there are any English file makers left. Uh, Bedford and Stubbs have both gone out of business or been bought up. So go for the Swiss files if you're in Europe. That's Valorb, V-A-L-L-O-R-B-E. And they've got a brilliant catalog on the website. It's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of files in and pictures and lots of tech uh, information about them. Or Beta, B-A-I-T-E-R. I went on the HS Walsh website this afternoon. They sell Beta. And the only place I could find Valor was, again, Cooks and Gold. Uh, they're really my kind of go-to place for tools. I'm not that impressed with the clocks, people, but there you go. Um, in the States, I don't know who the, um, uh, the kind of primary supplier of tools is. Again, if you can let people know in the live chat, if you've got experience of that, then that's really good. There is a problem when you buy files is that where we used to get them from the college, we used to get like a dozen to start the new academic year. 
and the manufacturer would not wrap them properly. So by the time they get to you, they've already been in the box kind of uh, moving about, which is a bit of a shame. Right, okay, we're gonna take a micro breather and we will be back at 47, uh, give people a comfort break and we will uh, wrap up today's session at least by looking at some different kinds of files, kind of a random sort of uh, thing. And also we'll talk about the elephant in the room. So I'll see you at 47, thank you. Right, it's a real file fest here. So <laughs> welcome back, files everywhere. So much to say about them. It does seem to be a subject that gets people pretty anim animated. Um, in a slightly kind of random way, uh, let's just make this a wee bit brighter again. Um, we've got here a needle file. So a needle file has got an integral handle um, this is a Swiss file, I can see it says Switzerland on there, uh, and it's a three square file. So rather obtusely, three square is the name for triangular. I didn't make that up, I'm afraid, it's just one of those quirks. So if you want to find a triangular section file, then three square is where you're at. And three square is what you want for making a square hole. You can't, as I said before, it's really difficult to get in the corners with um, a square file. You, you, the angle always gets more than 90 degrees. So if you actually wanna make a square hole, you need a triangular file. But your kind of problems doesn't stop there because again, there's a tiny, again, I show it in the video, a tiny little bevel running along there. So it doesn't have a sharp corner. Now I've lost my other three square file, but what I've done again is stoned off entirely one side. So that gives you two really sharp corners. There are very few files you buy that you don't modify by stoning or removing uh, some part of the teeth. So difference between a, a needle file, which most people will be familiar with, and an escapement file is escapement files are typically small, a bit smaller and um, a bit finer cut. Uh, but they, you can tell them apart because the escapement file's got a square handle. Um, now, in my video, I had a bit of a go at those kind of like pin vice things for holding needle files. I don't particularly like them. I think you lose control and it's, you spend time moving it from one thing uh, to the other. Um, so yeah, escapement files, incredibly useful. But what I would say is use the biggest, finest file you can. So that one I showed you a few minutes ago, wherever it's disappeared to, the number six cut, six inch file is incredibly useful. What you tend to file, find with small files, and I totally get it, people think if I use an escapement file, I'll get fine work. But actually what happens is you get things kind of nicely finished, but the overall picture is really ropey. So do what you can with the biggest, finest file you can before you're forced to use uh, an escapement file. 
I'll just show you some other random stuff. Uh, this one's quite cool. This is an old file on one side and it's uh, a burnisher on the other. Don't really use the burnisher side. I don't really kind of quite understand what it's for. It's quite nice when you're making new work to um, just kind of put a highlight on a bevel or something. Uh, but this is a, one of my favorite files. It's quite tapered. Uh, and what I've done at the end is I've ground it to um, a negative cutting angle here. And what this is incredibly useful for, and we'll risk going back to, I'm not sure how sharp it is, but it's a bit like a cabinet scraper. If you work on a restoration for wood, you, uh, or you know people who do, you'll have come across a cabinet scraper, and this is kind of the same thing. Let's say we've got our back cock casting here, and I haven't used my pens enough today. If you start to file this flat, um, like this in your hand, that's great. And you can go like this, da 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 da, -da and eventually you'll get it all flat, which is cool. But if you um, end up putting this against the plate of the clock, what you'll find, we've got our little steady pin here, is that you've got the tiniest bit of material under here, or the tiniest bit of outer flatness, and it doesn't actually sit down really flat. So what you can do with the file scraper, as I call it, I don't know what it's really called, is actually to remove material from the middle. I won't bother putting the bias because it's going to take too long. But you can actually scrape away or target material in the middle here. And this is just like a bearing scraper. Again, for those of you that are from engineering or you've ever seen a uh, like a, an engine refurb shop where the scraping in the bearings are on the lathe bed. This is something like this. It's a proper made tool, but it's basically the same thing, a scraper. So you can target small areas and you can see here under this back cock, and I'm doing this through the camera, keyhole surgery, um, that you'd end up with an area that was slightly raised and a bit that was cut away. So when you put it down like this, um, it uh, is undercut and it sits really flat. Also scraping like that, like an engineer scraping on a lathe bed or a mill uh, bed or something, looks really smart. It's a really cool kind of finish. So that's the file uh, burnisher. And I've got to leave a few minutes at the end to talk about the elephant in the room. Um, ah, this brand's got a pipe on it. That's cute, look. I don't know what the make is. Uh, and it's a four cut, you can just see there. So an old file. Um, you used to be kicking about in our old jewellery shop and you can see that somebody's got some flux on it at some point from soldering. What else have we got here? Oh, the Val Titan. Again, I talk about this in our video. So this is a brand by Valorb called Val, B-A-L-T-I-T-A-N. And it's a file that's got, I don't know if it's a, a surface finish or whether it's an extra bit of um, hardening or it's a particular sort of tool steel but this is like totally incredible uh, file. Um, it's, it's distinguished, it's got this bit of orange on the tang here. They make these in all kinds of different uh, shapes and cuts like the other files. And I would have never bought this, but I bought it as part of some new old stock clearance on eBay. And um, I didn't really know what it was, but it has just kept going and kept going and kept going. So although they're expensive, it's definitely paid for itself time and time over. So Val Titan is kind of a, an interesting thing that you might not come across very often. This is half round, but again, typically I just use this as um, a flat file. What else have we got here? So uh, we talked a bit about barrette. The beauty of the barrette is as I said, it's cut away on the corner. And when you buy one, you take your um, ceramic stone again, I haven't really got that much time to put any water on. But again, you just stone away that corner. Good thing about these pale colored ceramic stones is you can see where you've been, which is really useful when it comes to um, sharpening uh, gravers and things. Like that, keeps it cool. Don't sharpen your files on an off hand grinder. Now you eagle eyed people out there may have seen that I've actually taken some material off here on a wheel grinder. This was a diamond impregnated uh, wheel. So it was relatively cool, but you've got to be really, really careful. And certainly I wouldn't use a, you know, like a regular off hand grinder because if it raises the temperature too much, 
you will draw the temper of the teeth and then the teeth along the edge here will be soft and your file is ruined. So if you've got any spare cash, I would definitely think about investing in uh, a Barrett file. This handle needs replacing. I see it's uh, split there. More clock stuff. Um, this is uh, a cool clock file, the crossing file. Uh, and as the name suggests, it's for making or filing the crossings of a wheel uh, when you're making. Again, new making. This um, can't really show you along the edge of it without mucking about with my camera too much. But um, I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, everybody loves a bit of drawing. Let's draw it in file blue. So the crossing file um, has got two different radius. It's got a radius like that, we'll call it, and one like that, basically. And that radius is tapered, so you can kind of get into almost any radius of clock uh, wheel. Now, again, same old problem that when you buy the thing, it's got teeth all the way around here, and it's got teeth all the way around here. So it hasn't got any sharp corners. And we want to, let's say we're crossing out a wheel. Uh, we're making our handmade clock, which is, oh, it looks like an eye, doesn't it? Uh, the, I think the Dutch call this bird tongue because it's a section of a, a bird tongue. So let's say here's our wheel crossing with our teeth on it like this. And, um, here's our wheel. and we're trying to file into this corner. So what you can do there is to get your file and stone off some of these teeth, just like we've done, uh, you can just about, See it there, can see that edge glinting. Um, now I'm from Yorkshire, so I don't want to buy two files. If you were to stone it there and there, leaving uh, this space as the working face, that's great, but this space is ruined. You can't use this space because it hasn't got a corner anymore. So what I do is I stone there and there, which means that this is a working face and this is a working face. So when you're crossing your wheel out, you have to turn the work round or file from the other direction to get in the other side. But it means you can get one file um, out of two. So here, look, uh, we've got teeth to the edge. So this is our working side. We've got it stoned away. We've got teeth to the edge. This is our, uh, we've got, this is our working side and this edge is stoned away. So you can actually work from both directions. Um, right, good, nearly out of time which is great because it just gives me 25 seconds to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the pivot file, yay. Um, so uh, seriously, I will talk about pivot files if you really, 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 really want uh, in another week. I don't really use them as the, as the problem. I know that's what you're getting, I was getting around to. So people get uh, a thing like this. I think they do anyway, I don't do it. They put their nail in there and they go, that pivot that's got ridges in it, which it has, it's worn. Um, and then some people file the pivot kind of flat, again, cylindrical, if you like. I don't do that. Uh, very, very, very occasionally, never say never, um, because it's where you're reducing the pivot diameter, which impacts on depth thing, and then you have to do more bushing and so on. And of course the grooves in these pivots have been caused by um, lack of lubrication or contamination of the lubrication. And so there's damage occurring and that's going round the pivot in this direction, not axially. Axial grooves I would get that you wanna take those out because they're gonna damage the pivot. So I think a lot of people get into pivot polishing as a matter of course. And I'm sorry to leave this to the end. I didn't really wanna talk about it um, as you can tell. So my view is I really, as a default, never do it. And it just doesn't seem to cause a problem. And so if you do a lot of pivot polishing, this isn't an attack. But what I would say is maybe when you get a clock, just try it without and see how it goes. And I think you'll find it's it's all right. And I, I won't bring John in. Sorry, John, because I know, um, in fact, I will bring John in because I need some moral support here. So. Um, I mean, John is actually a working clockmaker. He works on some nice stuff. 
and he's bound to agree with me or not. But on the... oh, I do. I, I, I mean, I, I, it's one of those things that to begin with, I was embarrassed to talk about because I just thought that I was some kind of a freak. But I never polished. <laughs> I never polished pivots. Um, what can I say? Yeah, it's 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 something that you've really got to kind of build up confidence because um, yeah, and same thing for pivot burnishing. Maybe what is burnishing? This is a. I mean, maybe we need to kind of actually talk about it and get it out in the open because I don't. Well, it isn't. I don't care, but I've just gotten thick skin over the years, and I'm in an incredibly privileged position. I know because I've had the chance to work on some really kind of what people call important clocks and stuff. But it's really not that it's just kind of doesn't need doing and I think there's a lot of peer pressure but because everybody says oh, I've, I've polished all the pivots therefore I've done a good job so not an attack sorry to leave it to the last minute but I thought I couldn't kind of talk about files without talking about pivot files so we will have a session on it but in the meantime and again I know you'll keep the live chat going for a few minutes uh, now um, you may say, no, I always polish pivots. It's the proper way to do the job. And of course, there is something in that of being or seen to be thorough. And my method might look a bit slapdash, but I'm just thinking about the balance between that kind of pressure and doing a good job and the actual kind of health and longevity or long lastingness of the pivot and so on. So no right or wrong answer, no proper way to repair a clock. Absolutely not in my view anyway. To discuss we say so thank you very much again as always tried to cover as much ground as possible very happy to set up the lathe and do some pivot polishing or refinishing uh, there is one exception and that's the going barrel clocks often get the barrel arbor galled i'll try and find one of those where i actually might use some 3m's abrasive paper as well so bring out all the demons from the cupboard so thank you again, those people who've bought the book this week. I'm sorry about the state of the thing in America where we haven't gotten the books there yet, but thanks for all your support, whether you have or not. Watch the videos, like and subscribe. Thanks again to John. Thanks for Rob for rocking up and everybody. And we will see you next week with a bit of pallet making maybe and uh, steel hardening and that kind of thing. And we can come back to pivot files if there's uh, a need. So. We'll leave the live chat up until five minutes past so you can all um, kind of talk between yourselves. And again, thanks again. And we'll see you same time next week. Bye.